And uh, today, Stefan Sturm, uh, professor at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, will be moderating the talk. And Stefan is also a member of the, an officer of the SIAC activity group, is currently the secretary. So um, without further say, Stefan, please go ahead and um, moderate the talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Agostino. Today we have a special opportunity for the SIAM talks in that we have actually two talks today, two talks by young rising stars, namely first by Dana Firuzi, and then we have a second talk by Swain Olofsson. So the ground rules are each of the talk should be about 25 minutes. And after that, we will have a discussion of about five minutes. For the discussion, I would all ask you kindly to ask your questions in the chat area. And I will ask you then to uh, ask the question and unmute you if you would like. If you prefer that I'm asking the question for you, I'm happy to do this. You can note so in chat. Uh, I want also to uh, make everybody aware that this talk is being recorded and will be finally posted on the SIM Activity Group website so that people can Here's a talk, uh, also if you have no possibility to join. And finally, at 2 p.m., we will stop recording and can have some informal conversation if there is any need to have this. Okay, um, let's just directly start with our first speaker, who is Dana Firuzi. Dana is uh, Assistant Professor in Decision Science at HEC Montréal and she earned her PhD also in Montreal, or actually in Montreal, on the other side of the linguistic divide at McGill University in electrical engineering with Peter Keynes, and was then a postdoc in Toronto in statistics, and is now in decision sciences at HSC. And she will speak today about belief estimation by agents in major minor linear quadratic mean field games. Please go ahead, Dina. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation. So I'm going to talk about uh, belief estimation by agents in major minor LQG Input game systems. Uh, this is joint work with Peter Keynes, and I uh, invite him to chime in whenever he would like and uh, or is needed. Uh, so I start my talk with a motivation for the mathematical framework that I am going to present. Uh, it is related to electronic markets where there are high frequency traders and institutional investors. Uh, so uh, high frequency traders hold small amounts of inventories for a very short periods of time. They trade at a very high speed based on um, short-term predictions in order to make a small profits. Uh, this is why uh, institutional investors usually hold and trade a large amount of securities and their actions have a significant impact on the market movements. The examples of institutional investors are pension funds, hedge funds, or investment banks. So in this market, all uh, traders are competing against each other and they want to maximize their own profit. This is why all of them are affecting each other to their actions uh, because their actions affects uh, the price process. And the goal is for each uh, agent or trader is to find its uh, best execution or trading strategy. This is uh, formalized here. So we assume a market set of it. There exists n high frequency traders and one institutional investor. Here we have the uh, inventory dynamics. Q is the amount of inventory that trader I has at time T, and it trades uh, its inventory at rate new I. So when new is positive, the trader is buying. When it's negative, it is selling. Now when uh, traders make trades in the market, their actions have some permanent and temporary impact on the price. The permanent impact is modeled through the mid price here denoted by f which is the mid price between the between the middle price between the best bid and ask in the market and uh, the permanent impact is modeled by the trading rate of the major agent and the average trading rate of 
high frequency traders. Lambda zero here is the strength of the uh, major trader or the institutional investors uh, actions. And uh, Lambda is the strength of the uh, minor, the crowd, uh, um, uh, uh, the crowd uh, on the uh, crowd price impact. Now on top of uh, these uh, optimizing traders, there are also some non-optimizing traders in the market, uh, which are called noise traders or uninformed traders, and they are modeled by a linear process here. Sigma is the volatility of the market. Uh, now the uh, temporary impact is modeled through the execution price. It is in fact a result of uh, working through the limit order book in order for agent to execute it, uh, its order uh, completely. And uh, it is execution price is the price at which the agent makes trade. It is in fact the mid price which is temporarily impacted by the action of the agent. And finally we have the cash process for the agent whose increments are given by the negative of the execution price times the increments of the inventory. So all agents are coupled with each other to the price process and all of them are uh, subject to the same price process. There are different ways to model uh, the objective function for a, a trader here. We have an example of execution, uh, liquidation uh, objective function. So uh, this term uh, penalizes uh, the uh, inventory. So when buy is very large, the uh, trader wants to um, liquidate uh, very fast. Zt is the final cash. And this term here is the value um, associated with the execution that the trader makes at a terminal time. So the trader wants to maximize the sum of these processes. And that's why uh, they appear with negative sign uh, here in a minimization objective function. Now the case that uh, in particular motivates our work are uh, optimal execution problems with incomplete information. So in the market, uh, traders usually don't have the exact information about the trading actions of other traders in the market, but sometimes it is possible to have some noisy or inaccurate information about the activity of other traders. Also, uh, it is uh, possible that each uh, trader might not have uh, the exact information on its own inventory and trading actions. This is because usually traders make trades through uh, banks, agency brokers or other traders in the market. So at each time instant, they may not have the exact information about all the uh, uh, trading activities that are being take, taken place. Uh, this in particular happened to myself, so not in the electronic market context, but I bought something from an, uh, uh, an online store. And a couple of days after I received an email saying that, sorry, we didn't have a precise estimate of our inventory. So uh, uh, we don't have the item that you ordered. Uh, next time we will uh, try to have uh, more precise estimations of our uh, inventory. So in this uh, problem, uh, clearly we are not uh, considering social optima. We are considering the uh, coupling of all traders together. And then given the noisy observations and the objective functions for the uh, traders, we want to find what is the best way for them to behave in the market such that it is in their own interest and also a market equilibrium is achieved. So this problem in general is uh, difficult to solve because of this term here. So it leads to a high dimensional optimization problem and each trader needs to keep the track of other traders actions, which might not be possible in practice. We use major minor Murphy gain theory uh, for the linear quadratic case and extend it for the case with partial observations or noisy observations to answer this question. Now, before uh, getting to our uh, framework, a brief history about uh, major minor Mifid games. So these uh, types of games were introduced in 2010 by Mini Huang using the Nash certainty equivalence. Uh, due to the rich structure of this type of games, there have been a lot of uh, research going on uh, on this topic in the past years and uh, among them are different approaches and formulations of the uh, problem. So we can see uh, four uh, main approach here. Uh, uh, and uh, so in the past years, 
there have been a lot of reflections about uh, whether the solutions obtained via different approaches are consistent with each other or not. Well, the good news is that uh, the long time puzzle is solved now. So for the LQG case in a recent paper, Mini Huang showed that these solutions are consistent with that of asymptotic solubility and master equations. Also, myself in a recent note showed that the closed loop Nash equilibrium obtained through the Nash certainty equivalence and the probabilistic approach are identical. So both uh, papers are available on archive. So my note was just of the writing yesterday. So it's the first draft. It might be a little bit rough around the edges, but uh, the essence is there. Okay. Now uh, we have a general setup for the major minor AQG infinite games here. So uh, here superscript zero denotes the processes associated with the major agent and superscript I denotes the processes associated with a generic minor agent. So to be clear, X here is the state process and U0 is the control action. And here U0 clearly is the control action for the major agent. By definition, the major agent has a significant impact on the other agents. And if we uh, uh, track the orange color uh, where the uh, major agent suspect is displayed with, we see that it appears in the dynamics and the objective function of all agents. Moreover, the average state of uh, minor agents appear in the dynamics and objective functions of all agents. This is while an individual minor agent has a negligible impact on the other agents, especially when uh, the number of agents goes to infinity. This is uh, because each individual agent's state appears with coefficient one over n, so it's a weak type of coupling compared with the coupling with respect to the major agent's state. So in summary, the major agent is interacting with the average minor agent states, and each uh, minor agent is um, interacting with the major agent's state and the average state of the agents. So here, all agents are subject to stochastic linear dynamics and quadratic objective functions. The optimal execution problem that I uh, presented can be considered as a special case of this framework. Now we consider a partial observation patterns. So for the major region, we assume that it has a noisy version of its own state or a partial observation on its own state, no observation on other agents' states. So the information uh, set for the major agent is given by the sigma algebras generated by its uh, observation process. Moreover, we assume that each minor agent has partial observations of its own state and the major agent's state and uh, no observation on the other agents. Accordingly, we define the information set of the minor agent, which is uh, the sigma algebra generated by its observation process. So in the optimal execution uh, case, uh, these uh, uh, partial observations could be on the inventory or on the uh, trading action uh, uh, as an example. So this average term, although in the finite population creates some sort of um, complicated interactions, uh, it turns out that its limit when the number of agents goes to infinity, if it exists, has some simple properties and we can characterize it. So we follow the Memphis game methodology and solve the problem in the infinite population limit. In particular, we use the Nash certainty equivalence, for which the first step is to uh, derive the evolution of the mean field. So if you have seen the uh, mean field equation for the case where agents have the exact information, there are two extra terms here, two additional terms here. So the, this term is in fact the, ex the conditional expectation of the major agent's state and the mean field given the observation process or the information set of the major agent. This is in fact the belief of the major agent on the system states and it is adapted to the observation noise of the major agent. This term here is the average of 
the estimation errors of minor agents when the number of agents goes to infinity. By the estimation error, I mean the exact values of a state minus their estimated values by the, by the minor agent given its own information set. This is uh, uh, the uh, this process displayed in green is the system state from the viewpoint of a minor agent. I will specify this precisely in a few minutes. We can show that this process is driven by the major agent system noise and observation noise. So in the case with partial observations, not only the real values of the major agent state affect the mean field, but also the major agent's belief about the system states. And in general, the mean field is adapted to the uh, major agent system noise and observation noise. The parameters here are all deterministic. Uh, they are fixed point solutions to a set of mean field consistency equations that we will see towards the end of uh, the talk. So here we have the major agents uh, dynamics in the infinite population limit where the average state is um, replaced by its limit, which is the mean field. Now, in order to more colonize the major agents, the major agents dynamics, we extend its state by the mean field. So this will give us the extended state for the major agent or the system state from the viewpoint of a major agent. And its dynamic is given by the joint dynamics of these two processes. Now we don't have their exact values, so we use a common filter to generate their estimates based on the observations of the major agent. For those who might not be familiar with the common filter, it uses information from the dynamics of uh, the system and observations that the agent has in order to generate the estimates of the system states. So this matrix here, these vectors come from and the joint dynamics of the major agent and the mean field. And this, is, uh, this process here is called uh, the innovation process. And it is in fact the difference of the major agents uh, observation, the real observations, minus the estimated observations by uh, major, major agent itself. So this process here, in fact, gives us a measure of the estimation error. And together with the common filter, it generates a correction to the uh, estimation scheme here. And the common filter is designed in a way to minimize the covariance of the estimation error. Uh, here, more or less, we are using the standard common filter. So uh, these are uh, standard equations. Okay, now we have the common filter for the extended dynamics of the major region and having its objective function, we are able to use the separation principle to obtain the optimal control action for the major region in the infinite population limit. I don't go through the details here, I just want to emphasize that the optimal control action of the major region will be a linear function of its belief about the system states. And matrices here are solutions to the standard Ripatian offset equation. These parameters come from the system and cost functional uh, uh, parameters. Okay, now we get to the uh, minor agents uh, problem. So here we have the uh, minor agents uh, dynamics in the infinite population limit. So in order to more governance this system, we need to extend its state by the major agent's state and the mean field, as in here. But uh, just to remind you, the mean field itself depends on the major agent's belief about the system states. Moreover, the major agent is generated using its own control action, which is a function of this belief again. So in order to be able to compute this uh, minor agents state, we need these five components. So uh, we need also, uh, in particular, the major agents belief about the uh, system state. So this five component vector uh, forms the system state from the viewpoint of a generic minor agent. Now, since we don't have the exact values of these processes, again, we use a common filter. 
So the common filter generates these processes based on its uh, based on the observation process of uh, the minor agent. So this is in fact the uh, minor agent's estimates of the system states and the minor agent estimate of the major agent's um, estimates. So this is like uh, beliefs of beliefs. It's like uh, thinking about what the major agent is thinking about the uh, system states. We call uh, this uh, iterated estimation term the second order estimates. Now, if we use uh, the separation principle again, we can show that the optimal control action for a generic minor agent is a linear function of its uh, first order estimates and the second order estimates. This is why for a major agent, uh, its optimal control action only depends on the first order estimates. This is happen, uh, this happens because of the asymmetry between the dynamics and information patterns of the major agent and a generic minor agent. Well, uh, we solve the problem in the infinite population limit where minor agent and individual minor agent uh, cannot alter neither the major agent nor the mean field. So when the major agent wants to generate its uh, optimal control action, it only needs to uh, generate the estimates of the mean field. This is why well, a minor agent is impacted by both the major agent and the mean field. So in order to generate its uh, in optimal control action, it needs to generate um, its belief about the major agent's uh, belief about the system. Of course, this is the most general information pattern that we are considering. For example, if the major agent has uh, the exact information, then uh, only first order um, estimates are needed for both the major agent and uh, for, uh, for the uh, minor agent. Uh, to our knowledge, this is one of the rare examples of game theoretic situations with partial observations where agents need to estimate other agents' control actions and we will get a terminating recursion of beliefs of belief. As soon as we have two major agents, it's, uh, it's, uh, this might not be the case. So uh, uh, there are cases that uh, we can get into an infinite regress. Uh, this is a subject of our another work. There's no time to go over it in this work, but in order to uh, just put it briefly, uh, for the case when we have two major agents, because the major agents have symmetric dynamics, their partial information pattern could not be symmetric. As soon as we have symmetric partial information pattern between the two agents, uh, then uh, we will end up in an infinite regress. For a minor agent, it doesn't matter. A minor agent can have partial observations of its own state and the major agents. Uh, so we can prove that the optimal control actions that we obtained in the infinite population limit leads to an, um, a Nash equilibrium. So meaning that if one agent unilaterally deviates from this set of actions, it cannot improve its objective function. Now our goal was to solve the finite population problem. Now, if we apply the infinite population actions that we obtained here to the finite population system, we can show that this is an epsilon Nash equilibrium for the finite population system. And this epsilon goes to zero as the number of agents goes to infinity. And here I would like to emphasize that uh, this epsilon Nash property is achieved only using local noisy observations. So the major agent only has partial observations on its own state, and each minor agent has only a partial observations of its own state and the major agent's state, which is a, a great uh, simplification. And this is one of the fascinating features of the Mifid game theory, in fact. Uh, now the last step is uh, obtaining the mean field consistency equations. For this, we substitute the uh, minor agent's actions in its dynamics uh, to obtain its closed loop uh, system. And then we take the average of minor agents state and then their limit when the number of agents goes to infinity. And this should yield the same mean field equation that we use at the first step to compute uh, these uh, actions. 
So if we equate the two equations, we will get these two sets of consistency equations, which uh, whose uh, fixed point solution, which uh, will give us the coefficients in the mean field equation here. So these coefficients are obtained uh, by solving uh, these uh, sets of equation. Uh, I don't go through the details. These are uh, deterministic equations. The standard equations can be used uh, to using a standard methods. So uh, finally, here we have some simulation picture. So this is related to the estimates of the major agents and trajectories. So we have the first order estimates of uh, estimates by the major agent and by the um, by a sample of 10 minor agents and the second order estimates by the minor agents. So we see that starting from different initial conditions, these estimation errors uh, converge. So the uh, pink and the blue uh, lines show the first order estimates and the red ones show the second order estimates. So as we expect the second uh, um, estimates, it takes a little bit longer for them to converge. Here, and we have the same uh, picture for the estimates of the mean field. So as we can see again, starting from different initial conditions, uh, these uh, errors uh, converge after some time. So I will finish my talk here. So here are the references that uh, we have used uh, in this uh, work. So the first two are on the uh, theory of the uh, partial, uh, partially observed major minor LQG mean field gains. Uh, this one is on the mean field gains with two major agents. So we have solved the problem for the exact uh, information case. And then we discuss uh, partial information patterns, which lead to, to um, an intractable solution. And this one is a, uh, an application of this framework in the optimal execution problems. Uh, thank you, and I would be happy to answer uh, questions. So I hope I finished in time. Thank you very much, Dina. This was really a great talk. And yes, almost on time. Uh, so uh, for questions, again, please use the chat box to write your questions in. So far, we have received one question by Awash Fahim. Awash, uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, Stefan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you well. Yeah. Thank you, Neda, for the talk. Uh, very <laughs> nice talk. My, my question is about what you had in slide four, I believe, when you wrote the objective function of... Uh, here, of, you mean? Uh, traded. So here... Um, there is one specific uh, type of uh, major major trader that is like the managers of retirement funds and the big funds that they usually track a target fund like S&P 500 and then S&P 500 goes through some changes and then they start to adjust their own uh, mutual fund based on that and they start they, they have a deadline they have to kind of finish this process by selling and buying big uh, volumes of assets in a short amount of time. So you have this objective function. Can you explain this parameter in your objective function? How can you calibrate them to, to such a behavior uh, for, for uh, so, managers? Uh, so if I uh, understand it uh, correctly, so there is a tracking objective, right? So we want uh, a process that track uh, a specific um, um, uh, targets right okay yes okay so so here is uh, so for our case it, this is the inventory and then um so it's uh, kind of this is uh, can be uh, interpreted as the urgency parameter so when it's very high because the, uh, the trader wants to minimize this objective function so it means that uh, this thing should uh, becomes uh, smaller and smaller as soon as possible so uh, the Trader wants to uh, liquidate as soon as possible. And now, if uh, they want to track a specific target for, so for our case, it makes sense. For example, if the uh, traders want to follow the uh, average state of the market, 
so we can just uh, substitute this with the uh, with the difference between the agents uh, trajectory and the target that it wants to follow and this here is just the cache process so it's simple this again because uh, the uh, trader wants to uh, liquidate by the end of the trading horizon this uh, kind of uh, penalizes keeping the inventories at a terminal time so if the trader keeps uh, QT uh, inventories at a terminal time, it can liquidate them at a lower price than the marketing price. And when this site is very large, then it guarantees that the trader will um, uh, liquidate its uh, inventory by the end of the trading horizon. Many thanks for your answer. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. So there's one more question by Sebastian Chemongo, but he himself proposed that we can discuss this at the informal part after the second talk, that in the interest of time, we just go forward and hear the talk by Swain, and then in the informal part, we can discuss both talks again, okay? Okay, so I stopped sharing so that this one can exactly so thank you very much, Dana, and maybe a round of virtual applause for her from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Swain, do you want to start sharing? <clears throat> okay, our second speaker is Swain Olofsson, who is currently a research scientist at Columbia University at the Department of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research. He got his PhD from Purdue University with Jose Figueroa Lopez, worked then as a postdoc in Santa Barbara and spent also some time in industry with Goldman Sachs before joining Columbia. And today he will give a talk on personalized robot advising and in particular, how to enhance investments through client interaction. Please go ahead, Swain. Uh, thank you, Stefan. So can you see my screen? We see your screen well, yes. OK, so I'm going to talk about the a robot advising framework. And this is based on joint work with uh, Agostino Caponi and Talia Sare, uh, Sare Fablo. So the so robot advisors, in a nutshell, are um, online investment platforms that allow the clients to interact directly with an investment algorithm, a personalized investment algorithm. Uh, and these companies have been around for about 10 years since, since the 2008 crisis. And uh, some of the main selling points are affordable and accessible portfolio management. So the, the, compared to human traditional human advisors, they offer uh, lower fees, smaller account sizes, meaning that the minimum amount of money you need to invest is smaller. And they also offer some more advanced features like uh, tax loss harvesting. And in general, they are always expanding their services. Um, for instance, recently starting off to, to offer checking a savings account, uh, direct deposits and things of that nature. Uh, so this, this chart shows how assets under management, robo management has evolved in recent years and how they're projected to evolve going forward. So the current number is somewhere around 650 billion in the United States, with states, which is a significant, but still a small portion of overall uh, investable assets, maybe about one one percent, depending on how you define a robot advisor. Uh, this slide uh, this slide contains uh, most components of our models, an overview of our model. So so we view robot advising as um, human machine interaction system where we have a client who has the money to invest. Um, and this client is characterized by a dynamic risk aversion process, gamma C. So meaning that as, as time progresses, uh, the risk profile of this, this client changes. And then at certain uh, specific interaction times, the, the client communicates some information to the robot advisor and that's really where the role of the client ends in this process. Uh, then we have the robot advisor who has the task of investing the client's money. So the first thing the robot advisor, the robot advisor does is to construct a, a model or some, some sort of a view of the client's risk aversion, which, is, which we denote by gamma R. Um, 
and gamma R, this robotized model may, may deviate from the client's actual risk aversion, gamma C, uh, mainly due to what we call imperfect human machine interaction. So first, since the client and the robotizer do not communicate continuously, uh, there are changes in the client's risk profile that the robotizer does not observe in real time or observe immediately. And the second, even at interaction times, uh, the client may communicate information that is affected by behavioral biases and therefore not representative of the client's true intentions. So, so there are reasons for why gamma R and gamma C uh, may not be equal at all times. And then um, at the heart of this framework is uh, an optimal portfolio problem. So, so the robot as it is, derives an optimal investment strategy and we will introduce uh, this adaptive optimization criterion, adaptive in the sense that it adapts to changes in the, in the client's risk profile. So in the next few slides, we will talk in more, more detail about each of, each of these components. Here's, here are three uh, somewhat broad questions that are of relevance in robot advising that we seek to address. So first is how does Stochastic variation in the client's risk aversion. I mean, so the, 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 the client's risk aversion changes over time. So how does this impact the optimal portfolio strategy relative to, for instance, a client with a constant risk aversion? Um, second, is it the case that more frequent interaction is always better in the sense that it allows the robot advisor to construct a more personalized strategy? And then third, should the robot advisor always cater to the client's wishes, meaning that basically should it invest in line in, a, in accordance with the client's risk profile or deviate from it in order to seek better investment performance? So to answer these questions, we now we now talk about each, each of the model components in, in a little more detail. So first, uh, here are the market dynamics. So we have uh, we have a single risky asset S and a risk-free asset B. So the risky asset here is representative of the overall stock market or, or a broad stock market index. And the asset returns follow a, a regime switching model. So we have a second stochastic process Y, such that conditionally on the value of Y, the risky assets, assets return Z has a certain mean and certain volatility. Uh, y itself is a Markov process independent of the asset dynamics. And in this model, we interpret Y uh, as an economic state factor. The value of Y captures uh, the current economic uh, conditions. Um, these are defined on a probability space omega, which also supports uh, this third stochastic process or sequence of random variables epsilon, which as we'll see on the next slide will, be, will, will impact the client's risk aversion. So this sequence epsilon is independent of the market variables Y and Z. Then we define uh, filtration F, which is generated by these three stochastic processes in a model, uh, the state variable Y, market return Z, and this exogenous randomness epsilon. And we use this uh, notation here, parenthesis, to, the, to the, denote the path of the process. So here is uh, the client's risk aversion process. So the, so the client is characterized by the client's risk profile is characterized by this risk aversion process, gamma C, which is allowed to depend on each of the three random sources in a model. So it depend, can depend on the economic state, can de depend on the mar market returns, and this exogenous randomness, epsilon. So we list there, so in particular, three things that I can, uh, can affect the client's risk aversion. One is just the passage of time. So empirical work shows that in general, the risk aversion of, of individuals goes up as they get older. Uh, and the simple, simplest robot advisors simply construct a portfolio only based on the client's age. So as the client gets older, um, the robot advisor reduces the market exposure. So essentially what is called a, a target date fund. Uh, second, the, the client's risk aversion can be impact, impacted by idiosyncratic or, or client-specific shocks. Which are, which are driven by this random variables epsilon. And this basically includes anything, uh, any changes in the client's personal or professional status, for instance, 
which are not related to uh, the third component, which are market returns uh, and economic conditions. So, so the planetary conversion can also be affected by realized market returns and changes in the economic outlook. And we list there a few, pay, a few uh, references in support of this, and in particular, it's well established that uh, throughout the business cycles, economic condition change, uh, uh, the risk aversion of, of investors changes as well. So, so the, the, the client and the robot are now interact repeatedly throughout the investment horizon. And these interaction times form a sequence of stopping times with respect to the filtration of the model. So, which means that interaction can in the most uh, general sense be, be generated by or triggered by uh, client specific events or economic state changes or some sort of a market event related to the market returns. But then at the each interaction time, right? so at the cave interaction time, TK, the client communicates a risk aversion parameter to the robot advisor. And as mentioned earlier, we, so we denote this parameter by psi. And as I mentioned earlier, this may not be equal to the client's risk aversion because of the client's uh, behavioral biases. And we will focus in particular on the simplest case where interaction times are uniformly spaced. So TK, the kth interaction time, is just K times a phi, where phi is the time between interactions. So if phi is equal to one, there's interaction at all times. If phi is equal to two, there's interaction, there's interaction at every other time point and so on. Uh, and here is the point of view of, of the robo advisor. So recall that the robot advisor does not observe the client's risk aversion directly, so it needs to construct a model of the client's risk aversion. So first we define the information set of the robot advisor or the filtration of the robot advisor, FR, and it's generated by essentially four stochastic processes. So the first two uh, is the market information. So the robot advisor observes uh, the economic state and it observes market returns. So the second two uh, processes are information communicated by the client. So this includes um, interaction times so far, the T, and the information communicated by the client so far, which is psi. So, so there are two separate sources of information, one from the market, one from the client. And then based on this, so we define this, so we define this state variable D. So I will refer to D as the, as the state variable and it essentially contains stochastic processes that generate the robo-advisor's filtration. And then in the most general sense, the, ro the robo-advisor's model is simply a stochastic process adapted to this filtration. So that means that at time n, the robo-advisor's model, gamma r, can be written as a function of the state variable dn. And remark there that in general, with more interaction, robo-advisor gets more information and this, this filtration gets larger or expands. So, so now we can define the optim optimization problem uh, faced by the robot advisor. So we have a fixed investment horizon T, capital T. And then at each time N, the robot advisor uh, faces this mean variance objective functional and tries to app optimize or maximize this functional. So this is given in terms of the return on the client's wealth. So Xn there is the client's current wealth. X capital T is the client's wealth at maturity. And the superscript pi means that the investment uh, self-financing investment strategy pi is followed. So pi here is any at this point any self-financing investment strategy. So the objective is to maximize the return on the client's wealth. And as you can see from the uh, definition of this probability measure P subscript NXT, the initial condition of this problem essentially fixes what the robot advisor knows at time n. So little x is the client's wealth at time n. Little d is a value of this state variable capital T, which contains historical market returns and client communicated information. And we also remark that the risk return trade-off coefficient here is the robot advisor's model of the client, gamma r. And again, this is stochastic process. So at time n plus one, this will be something different. At time n plus two, this will be something different and so on. So this, this adapts to both market information 
and client communicated information. Uh, now it's well known that so 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 the optimization problem is essentially, essentially given now by a sequence of objective functionals uh, j n for each time n we have one of these mean variance functionals. So the object so the optimization problem is defined by a sequence of objective functionals and this is a, a time inconsistent stochastic control problem. Uh, in the sense that the standard dynamic programming principle uh, does not not apply. So informally, if we define uh, find the strategy pi that maximizes j n, then at the next time point n plus one, the strategy is no longer going to be optimal. So what we set out to do at time n will never be realized. Um, so we approach this problem uh, using the framework of uh, Bjork and Murkozy, who uh, study uh, time inconsistent stochastic control in, in discrete time. And we derive a time consistent strategy. So this is essentially what we do. Uh, so what these first two equations there say is that um, at time n, when we uh, decide the optimal strategy at time n, we essentially take into account our future actions. So we, we know what we're gonna do in the future. We assume that we behave optimally in the future. This feeds into what we do to, 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 uh, today. So that's what the, 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 the superman condition here says. Uh, the second point on this slide is a technical, technical, technical condition saying that we consider strategies that are adapted to the robot advisor's filtration. It's the robot advisor that is solving this problem uh, that satisfy the square integrability condition. Uh, and now, following these, line, uh, these lines, we, we derive an extended system, system HAB system, system of equations. Uh, when we solve this uh, system and show that there exists an optimal solution of this form. So, pi n here is the proportion of wealth that you allocate to the risky asset at time n. So it's the proportion of wealth allocated to the stock market basically at time n, and the rest goes into the risk-free asset. Um, so we can see here on, on the right-hand side, there are essentially two, two quantities that are appear. First, we see uh, Zn plus one, and this is the excess market return at time n plus one, so at the next time point. And we have also Rn plus one, which is the terminal value, so the time t value of $1 invested in the optimal strategy starting at the next time point, uh, time t n plus one. So you can see how, uh, from this formula, how future decisions feed into what you're gonna do today. Um, and we also remark to you that you can see explicitly that this uh, formula depends on the current risk return trade-off, uh, gamma n r. But it also depends implicitly on the future dynamics of this program of, of this process. So, so this, these conditional expectations essentially average over future paths or distribution of future paths of this process. And we can uh, look a little closer at each each of these two terms. So the first one is essentially looks like what you get uh, in this for the standard single period Markowitz strategy. Essentially, if you if you optimize just the uh, a single mean variance functional, you get something looking like the first term. Uh, the second term is, uh, is interesting and it can be interpreted as intertemporal hedging demand. And in particular, it incorporates the effect of market returns on the client's risk aversion. So, so what these arrows there show, so let's, we can think about a client whose risk aversion is negatively correlated to market returns, meaning that as a market goes down, the client's risk conversion goes up. Um, as the market goes up, the client's risk conversion goes down. And what these arrows there show, the clients with such a risk conversion process, uh, well, this has a positive impact on this covariance term, meaning that you subtract in the formula. So there's a negative hedging demand for a client with risk of such a risk conversion process, which leads to uh, the robot advisor reducing the market exposure of a client who is sensitive to market returns relative to a client who is not affected by market returns. So, so, so uh, this kind of intertemporal hedging demand uh, uh, is well known, well known in, the, in the literature, but here it appears because of, of the cli client's dynamic risk aversion process, which is different from existing literature, for instance, the, the seminal paper here of Barsky, where, uh, where it appears because of correlation in, in, in changes in, in 
between in the changes in the economic state variable and market returns. So here, the economic state variable is actually independent of market returns, but we still get this intertemporal hedging demand because of um, the client, how the client's risk aversion responds, responds to market returns. So uh, this proposition here offers an alternative view of the optimal, optimal strategy, essentially in terms of quantities that can be computed using backward induction. So without uh, going too much into all the notation here, so the, the mu's on the right-hand side, mu subscript nd, they can be computed by averaging over the distribution of the state variable at the next time point d n plus one. And in particular, by doing this, this backward induction, uh, we also compute the compute moments of the return of the optimal investment strategy denoted by mu here. So you, you get that as a byproduct of, of computing the optimal strategy. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that these, these can be used to compute the, the first two moments can be used to compute the, uh, the value function. So, now we uh, switch, switch uh, gears a little bit and consider uh, application of, of our model. So first we looked at the effect of interaction on portfolio personalization. So we define a measure of portfolio personalization. And the question is whether more interaction is always better. Allow, does more interaction always allow the robot advisor to construct a more personalized uh, portfolio? So here we're a little more specific we assume that, that the client's risk aversion gamma C is of this form, so the, of this multiplicative form, essentially it has a factor gamma ID capturing idiosyncratic shocks to the client's risk aversion. And, and between two time points, this gap process gamma ID is constant with certain probability. And it has this uh, log normal jump with a certain probability. And the important thing is that changes in this, this component are not observed by the robot advisor between interaction times. So the longer uh, the longer the time between interaction time, the more the robot advisor loses track of, of this component of the client's risk aversion. And then second, we assume that the that the client communicates a risk aversion value that is that is biased. So we assume that the client suffers from behavioral biases, it communicates a risk aversion value of this form. So psi n is what, the, what is communicated by the robot advisor and it is, is of this form. So it's equal to the client's actual risk aversion, gamma c, times this bias, gamma z, which depends on recent market returns. So to make a long story short, if recent market returns have been poor, the market has been underperforming the client may feel overly pessimistic and communicate a risk aversion value that is too high. Um, and vice versa, if the, if the market has been doing well, the client may communicate a risk aversion value that is uh, too low. Um, and we have there a, a, a specific form for, uh, for the bias and how, how it depends on recent returns, which captures uh, two things in particular. So one is that negative returns have a greater impact on the client than positive returns. This is this notion of, of loss aversion. The second, the longer the time between interactions, the smaller the effect of this bias is. So this is uh, an, an empirical, empirical fact. And our model essentially happens because over longer time periods, the, the average market return gets closer to the expected market return. So in that sense, uh, less interaction is better because it reduces uh, the client's behavioral bias. And we have this parameter beta, which captures the magnitude of the client's behavioral bias. So, so if beta is equal to zero, there's no bias. Uh, if, beta, if beta is positive, there is some bias. And then finally, we define this measure here of portfolio personalization, which really captures how well, the, the robot advisor is able to track the client's risk aversion. So gamma, so if gamma R is almost equal to gamma C at all times, then this measure R is small. So small value of R uh, is equivalent to high measure of personalization. 
and we view this function as a function uh, we, view, we view this as a function of, of phi, which is the time between interaction, and is also parameterized by this by beta, which quantifies the client's behavioral bias. So larger value of beta, larger bias. And we show that there exists a unique interaction in time between interaction phi that minimizes this measure. So essentially, there's an interaction frequency that strikes a balance between the client between the robot advisor receiving information in a timely manner or quickly, and this information not being too tainted by behavioral biases. We show that there is a unique phi that, that minimizes this function. And this value of this optimal value of phi is increasing in beta. So if the client has more behavioral bias, it's better to interact less. So here are some uh, numerical results. For instance, um, if beta is equal to zero, you can see this is minimized at phi equal to one, meaning that's optimal to always communicate. And then when beta becomes two, four, six, the optimal value of phi gets larger, meaning that it's better to interact less. And here's a, a second application. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna briefly uh, review the idea here. So this is motivated by the fact that both the risk aversion and the market risk premium or, or the market chart ratio are counter cyclical, which has which has has an, has the effect that when the, when the market uh, market chart ratio is high, that's when, it, when it's beneficial to invest, the client is inclined to reduce market expo market exposure. So it's sort of a, a a buy high, sell low effect. And then we look at whether the robot advisor should cater to the client's wishes or counter or try to counter the client's wishes and in order to seek better uh, investment performance. So in particular, we look at the, we look at the sharp ratio of the, of the optimal portfolio and how that improves if the client, if the robot advisor counters the client's wishes. And we look also at the terminal distribution of the, of the client's wealth. So here are uh, some few future possible future developments. So one is, so in the analysis before, we assumed that the uh, interaction frequency was fixed. So it was a uniform interaction schedule. In practice, it would be good to have uh, an interaction schedule that somehow controlled the client's risk aversion and assured good investment performance. So for instance, when, when the economic outlook is, is bleak and the client is feeling maybe not too great about it, it might be better to interact less with a client who may be inclined otherwise to withdraw money. And then second, uh, it's important to look, have a closer look at the nature of the human machine interaction and how the robot officers should take uncertainty in this in, into account in its investment recommendations. So in general, the, the, this is a noisy and biased process. Uh, and like I mentioned, the last point, it may, even at uh, crucial times, it may not be easy to reach the client, or the client may not be willing to respond. Um, so for further information, you can reach out or you can look have a look at our, our paper, which is available um, online. And uh, this is the last slide. I think I'm right on time. Okay, thank you very much, Swain, for the nice talk. Uh, let's have some questions. Again, if you have any questions, please ask in the chat box. So far, I have seen only one which is by Igor Chalanko. So thank you, thank you, Sven. I think the question was already answered. I just wanted to make sure that I understand correctly that the interaction time are not actually stopping time per se, a deterministic stopping time. So it's uniform grid, so there is no- Yeah, so, yeah, so, it, it, so in this last application where I was looking at this trade-off, then we assumed that the interaction times were deterministic, but in the general model, that, that we solve, then uh, they are indeed allowed to be um, general stopping times. But it, it was in this application later on that we are actually only focused on. Um, but when you say general stopping times in, 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 in what sense, the filtration observed by the advisor or by the investor or? Uh, investor, so, so we have this filtration here that is generated by, um, so these uh, three sources right. of randomness in the model. So, so the stopping times are, so 
so the interaction times are stopping times with respect to this, this filtration right here. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can talk afterwards because yeah. the next question would be, you know, if, you, if these are not accessible stopping times, then you don't really, I don't know how to solve it optimization problem. But maybe the second question, a quick follow up, uh, if I can do it, and then we can maybe move to the uh, informal part is that the choice of this treating the timing consistency of this problem by Bjork and Morogochi, is it like specific because you like this approach or any other reasons? Because there are many approaches to deal with this timing consistency. So, you know, you can change the parameter gamma, you can uh, increase the state space, you can do many things. So. Uh, any rationale of choosing? No, I mean, yeah, you're, that's right. There are other approaches to, uh, I mean, we, li we like this approach and, uh, but it was, was a natural thing to do, but in general, like, uh, yeah, we, we could have chosen another, uh, yeah. another, another way to handle time and consistency. That's just, uh, this is a choice that we, we had to make in, in the model. No, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the approach too. We wrote a paper on that too. So, but uh, that's uh, that's just, you know, wanted to make sure that this, there is nothing specific about robot advising because of this philosophy of playing yourself in the future. So I think I will say thank you for now and definitely can continue afterwards. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Sven. Yeah, yeah, thank you all. Uh, okay. Just, uh, Stefan, before you uh, move to the informal part, I want to make some announcements. Uh, okay, so the first uh, announcement is that we have moved uh, the deadline for submission of uh, mini symposium and it will be on January. So you still have uh, other time to submit and we, we got a lot of submissions. So thanks uh, for all of you that have already done that. But there was a demand of extending the line because other people were a bit uh, time constraints and they wanted to profit of the winter break uh, to complete uh, their mini symposium. So. You will have time um, until January. And uh, also, uh, we will uh, stop here for the winter holidays, but the seminar series will resume in January. So the next talk is scheduled for January 21st uh, after the winter break. And uh, yeah, but the, um, as we know, this seminar is running in parallel with Bachelier Financial, uh, Financial Society. So they are also holding a seminar series and uh, they will also be taking a break uh, until January 14th. That's it. And say a starting with a talk by Agnes Lem, and we are starting by a talk with by Carol Alexander. Yeah, exactly. Our next video will be our Alexander Carol. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody, and uh, I think we can stop the official.